What's going on guys? Today I wanted to make a second video in support and to cover some things that I probably was not as coherent and made as clear when it came to the roster building and evolutions in LCS. Mostly, I mean, it comes from the comment of a user that highlights the things that I missed and things that I probably did not go into as much detail and it was a little... Like I said, not as clear. And so this video, I really just want to hone on exactly pretty much what I wanted to get at, which was why NA rookies failed. And really, it comes down to these five simple things. It's well, they're not really simple, I guess, in the end, but the team environment, the strength of the roster, the systems in place, the time. In other words, the time that you're given to a player to actually develop properly. And then, of course, proper self-evaluation. So, in 2013-2014, which I did talk about, you know, of course, because I went over every single year in the last video, but more exactly, back in this day, because there was no systems really in place, no structure, the way players scouted was pretty much as you would do a little bit currently now, which is, you look at the leaderboard, you look at the ladder, you play solo queue, and the guys who you think are really good, who you're playing against, who are doing really well, guys, maybe we should pick them up. Maybe we should get this guy. Like, that was pretty much how things worked back then. I mean, that's how we got Wild Turtle. Of course, Chaos had his, like, whole spiel and everything that, you know, had his downfall. But, like, this is how Wild Turtle joined TSM. I mean, he was in the system, not in the TSM system, but in the, like, league circuit plane. But... People knew that he was really good on the ladder, and so they gave him a chance. And he just so happened to fit really well with the team and vibe really well with the team. But yeah, he got that opportunity because they're like, yeah, let's just throw him in for, on the ladder and see what happens. And he just killed it. So they must have had a nice, at least welcoming situation for him on the team. And here we are. Meanwhile, we have guys like Doublelift. You know, when he first joined, he played with... Chouster, he played with uh, Afro then now, right? So Chouster was the first one. And to be honest, Chouster is a bit harder on you, like quite harder on you. And that's kind of a common theme you'll see with certain players, whether it's players like Prince, Doublelift, and <laughs> Double will actually do this to his own support later on. Um, but having that kind of person, like you have to have the right personality, the right traits to really handle that. And so there's definitely any rookies who just were not in a good did either did not have the right mindset or did not have the capabilities to deal with players like that which just naturally kind of blew them apart <laughs> kind of just lost their confidence and really derailed their career a bit and that is something you you just cannot have at all right double Oath was so often to be one of the players who actually could handle it but also adopted it and so that kind of created its own issues later on but he did it, this did so happen to work for them in the end of the day because he was so so driven to actually get better and like make this his like you know his dream his job his livelihood so guys like double lift guys like jojo guys like even masu like these are the kinds of players who can handle this kind of intense criticism even guys like apa and these are more like newer set players who have like a really high confidence in themselves and abilities to just deal with both public scrutiny and their own teammates scrutiny no matter how hard it is and these players are rare i'll say this right now in terms of league like the league situations like this is pretty rare to see and looking back here to this these kinds of players are a little bit more impervious towards like the team environment. They can be a little bit more impervious towards the strength of roster, even to the systems in place. Like these three things will affect a ton of players, except there are a few notable players, like I mentioned there, who are actually capable of dealing with it. But that is not the norm. And that's not exactly what I want to focus on. I want to focus on the guys who couldn't and why this just did not work out the way you wanted to work out, right? So yeah, like I said, these early years, like these were like guys you just pulled from solo queue who liked each other and they did pretty well. You know, 
is Cloud9 was literally that, entirely that, and they just so happened to vibe really well, and it that was amazing, right? You know, we move on to like Dignitas, and you like they tried Golden Glue a little bit, but this is one of the cases where it's just the strength of roster is not that great. And so even though Golden Glue was always called like the scrim, scrim god, right? Like he was always called like the scrim god. Um, this was just, how would I say it? Whether it was just an issue with translating it over its stage or whatever the case is, or just not getting enough confidence from his teammates that he could do it, Strength of roster does have some implications in that. I don't think this roster would have given Golden Glue an actual issue in terms of environment. I don't think any of these players are like that horrible to deal with in the end of the day. And you could also say it might be a time issue in the fact that like, did you actually give him proper opportunities? Because he was playing, like he plays in the lower league, right? He does well in the lower league. He gets into the upper league, doesn't do as well. Maybe he simply just did not have the the right roster to really just give that confidence and teach him the right things. And so it just didn't pan out. Or, of course, there are cases where you could just be a bust and that's okay. Like, that does happen and that's okay. But moving on from this, because, again, in the early years, like, there wasn't as much setup to really discuss what I want to discuss. It's only when you start getting into... Kind of like... How would I say it? I guess I guess it's more so not even this year yet. It's not exactly this year yet either, because in 2015, we were still just throwing around some like, you know, old time players, and there's some like imports who did turn out well. Like I mentioned how TSM, like with Bjergsen, I thought like having Santorin added with Bjergsen, like this was pretty good. Plus boy with local Doko. Like there was definitely some pretty nice things, but the teams were still not operating on a good set of like decisions, dec decisions yet, and sort of like the mix of players that they have. It's only when we get into 2016, right? 2016, where now we have another example of the wild turtle, right? The wild turtle uh, example of where you just pluck a guy out who was doing like well that you thought was doing well. This was Stixe. He had a better demeanor, and they threw him into CLG. Smithy was really good. Darshan was already pretty decent. Hui was an exception, but he had a specific style that could work. And Afro, I don't know, I don't remember what Afro's whole persona was at this point. I don't know, because I'm pretty sure he was still very driven on like wanting to play harder. I know in his later years, he definitely became less driven. And so because of that, if you pick up a rookie who wants to play and win, and then your support is not as like interested in that anymore. It becomes kind of jarring and disconnected, which is a partial issue that they had on FlyQuest later on. Um, and with this specific roster, Afro indeed was pretty like in it, and Xmithy was definitely able to cover certain like issues that anyone may have in terms of just playing the map. So. The team environment was good. I know that for sure because the team environment just made sense for everyone just getting along. Then you had the strength of the roster, which was good. I mean, like, all these players were rather reasonable and good. Then you go into the time given for a player to develop, and 6A did do well pretty quickly. So, like, that was not as, as much of an issue to worry about. But he was given more opportunities, so that worked great for him. And then we had... What was the last thing? The last thing I mentioned was... Let me make sure I'm not, I'm not saying this wrong. The system's in place, right? And I don't know if Zix, Zeeks had the right system in place, but their set of players so happened to create a way to approach the game that worked for sticks and of course i'll say this right now ad is the easiest position to plug in for the most part mostly because ad just needs to do their job and you're fine so as long as ever like if other people are covering different parts of the game your ad is just performing it makes things pretty easy so xmithy did cover that afro could help cover that who he did add on to a bit darshan definitely added on to it so like you have a set of players who were all able to cover different responsibilities so Stixay could play his, his game and focus on what he was good at. 
And this is a great example on why this CLG roster did so well. Like, with adding this kind of rookie here, with the way the other players could play, that's why it works so well. And that's also why you see rosters with the inspired iteration, and then you had Impact and Whippo as, like, different variations with inspired. These guys will harp on you pretty hard. And that can be difficult to deal with, but these guys do cover a lot about the game, like what decisions to make in the game, so you as an individual can focus on your game. And that's, they so what happened to have some players who are pretty impervious to it. Like I said, you know, these were guys I mentioned already, but they had Jojo and Masu. Danny was not as good at dealing with this. This was just not something he was really capable of handling as much. So because of that, he kind of fell through and so that is like the core issue with certain players like this like xmithy is not like this like you can view them both as commanders but xmithy was more chill and he would not like make you feel as pressured inspired and definitely does and impact whippo well i know impact does i don't know if whippo does he definitely talks a lot though and wants to you know discuss what he thinks is good and not good and that's just one variation of it, right? These are two different variations. These are a later fold of what was happening that worked with players that worked. One didn't work. I don't know how Busio is. I don't know how Busio handles it, but it seems like okay. And so that's how you can have both your strength of roster and your team environment kind of really needs that right rookie pick. Like, I think if this current, you know, the current TL roster that we have now, this one, if you tried to fit in a different North American mid laner that's not named JoJo or APA, I don't think it works. Like, even if, let's say, the player was better than APA strictly, I think it's just, just so happens with how, what the players are and how, like, discussions can be created that I don't think they would have done well. I think he specifically did well because he can handle it. And that's a complete, and that again, that's, that's you understanding what this rookie is capable of. Like, you know, when I go back to 2021 Dignitas with Fake God, you know, this guy was a pretty hyped up player. Uh, granted, I will say at the time, he as an individual did note that he had the wrong perspective and tried to act like he knew things a little bit too much. But if you look at the roster, you know, we have Soligo and Fake God. Like, these were the two guys coming up, right? I th they were on 100 Thieves, I believe. 100 Thieves Academy, that one. Um, and then you threw in Dardock with Neo. So I know Neo doesn't really add, like, anything at all. Like, this guy doesn't really contribute towards your team environment. Uh, he's an okay AD, right? Granted, we have two rookies here. So your strength of roster is already on the weaker side, okay? So two is, like, not the best. And Dardock is still quite a fighter, and I don't know if, honestly, Afro was going to be willing to contest this that much. If he was going to be willing to really, like, fight Dardock that much. And I can tell you right now, there's no way these two guys were going to fight him at all. Like, this, I doubt this would have worked out well for them, trying to contest Dardock. And this team environment, the number one, was just, it was just bad. It was just bad. And so Fake God at this time, he still kind of is like this now even. Whereas like he was definitely a bruiser player. Like not as good on the AP picks, but pretty 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 decent like bruiser player. And Soligo was all about the mages. There was this whole thing with him and Yasui at the time where I believe this is the Dignitas where in summer they flipped Soligo out when Soligo actually did decent and they put Yusui in because melee picks were good. So like melee picks were good at the time. And then, I don't know what it was, I think it was uh, midway through the meta, like midway through the meta, it went back to mages. And then they flipped them again. I, actually, I don't even know if they flipped them again. I think they didn't even flip him back. I think they kept Yusui in anyways. So now the player who was better at mages is not in the mage meta the player who was better on melees was in the melee meta and the guy who did well in the spring split soligo this was soligo like he he helped a lot with this part ended up just losing an opportunity and fading away going back into academy and so this is an issue with time 
you know this this is just like a time and then just not trusting to let him play through the melee you know matter even though he's not as good at it just trusting to let him play through it because in the end of the day you know when you're both doing reflections on like a self-evaluation towards like how you built the roster and how that player did along with like how much time are you given for a player to actually properly develop players need to learn the meta like this has to happen like as a new player you just have to learn the meta like if you're bad at melee picks and they become the thing you just have to learn how to play some of these champions it's just how it is like is flipping out a player just because the meta was not suiting him isn't really the best of choice like you need to look at the horizon later on like how do we actually want to develop and grow these players and so this is a case of where you see dignitas just getting cold feet and throwing yasui in and then they didn't really do anything like yeah they did they did okay i guess they technically did better in spring and even though the strength of the roster is not actually that great the fact that you went 11 and 7 and if you look at some of the teams on like this year like oh, some of these teams are actually pretty damn good and we went 11 and 7 and you just didn't trust the process and that's what happens and you know it sucks because he actually was a decent player and i think if he just was given the right both like also the right system in place and that like you know the confidence given to him and the confidence given to his teammates that he will get through it this is just a really great case of how you know you just miss out on a player and for fake god i'll admit i don't remember as much about him in the early in his early years of his career but one of the key things to do with rookies is just binding them together and having them push through the whole process together in a way and that is what we get with 100 thieves like because with this roster you have sniper and quid who are both kind of kind of like your stereotypical kids per se and everything um but they are very much in it to win it together and like joking around with each other hyping each other's plays and everything and that kind of environment it's intoxicating like i want you want more of it like it actually motivates you to want to improve and do better and make big plays yourselves and stuff like that and hundred thieves got it right whether you know they became kind of a one-dimensional team right they were pretty like one-dimensional in the end of the day but this decision the system they made this three number three was really good by them this was such a great way to deal with it because it let them improve and do well in their first split because i can tell you right now if they were like one one in 13 i think they would have i think they would have gone cold feet and i think certain changes might have happened and bad things could happen as well like when you're losing all the time as a rookie it's hard it's hard i mean it's hard already as a veteran but as a rookie like you just feel really bad about it and it's not like the strength of this roster is actually that incredible like honestly it's just like it's like okay right like to me like the strength of this roster is just like okay going into the split or sorry this is actually two sorry this is two uh and but the team environment was really good the time that they're giving them the self-evaluations really good you know i should have done this in more order you know three like i said like the system in place that they did to try and prove really good i mean yeah they obviously like other teams like to have you know a little bit more set players ended up improving their team chemistry and able to and team play in order to like beat them out later on but i think this was a really great example and it's an example i've talked about before of just how you do things properly you know we go further back to it's a good year i don't think that's a good year with those guys I think oh this this one's not bad for this if we go to this one so for this year you know we had we had viper and i had talked about this we had viper santor and po belter wild turtle with jj and so jj i believe jj did not oh he did play a little bit with flyquest this year i remember that well for jj you know i guess we'll start from this just to make this a little bit as clear as I can with JJ, you 
right now, if you look at him in Academy, he's pretty good. Like, I mean, like, some of the decision-making and, like, ways he's approaching the game is actually good, and that's mostly because he gained a lot of confidence in himself. And so he is more impervious to one and two. Like the, like, the strength of the roster and the team environment, he's more impervious to this. And that came from him having time to assimilate and figure this stuff out himself. The thing is, he did not have necessarily the right players, the right situation set up for him to really do this in the first place. And this also could be just like a self-evaluation thing as well, or like I said, or just even the systems. Like these three like parts here really end up kind of helping a rookie figure out and like able to gauge like their longevity in the scene. And for for JJ, you know, playing with Wild Turtle is great. You know, he's a really chill player. He does his job. You know, you can kind of branch out and learn your things the way you want to learn. At the same time, I don't know if Wild Turtle was as dead set on like actively teaching as much. And the other players I had, like Onda, Shrimp, Keen. Onda is a quiet jungler, and so he naturally needs other players to lead. And this was always the biggest issue he had was that he was quiet. Like he individually as a player, he was actually pretty good. Like mechanically wise, mechanics wise, he was pretty damn good. It's just he so happened to play in a role that requires you to talk and he didn't do so. And he had laners, players, Keen and Flame, who just aren't really aligned to helping with that. And Wild Turtle was never gonna fully take over. So JJ is left in a position where he actually needs to be a big voice as a rookie. So in the end of the day, Onda was kind of set up to fail and needed really specific things. And then JJ was kind of set up to fail. So this was kind of the wrong approach towards like how these players can have the stability to actually do what they want to do. And, you know... I push into the next year with FlyQuest, and you know, so JJ's playing again, right? And if Saucer does better, you know, we have Viper now. Viper was, you know, a pretty hyped up, riven one trick player. Uh, I probably don't want to say riven one trick per se, but like that was initially what he was known for. We had Santorin, Poe Belter, Welter. So again, we got two, we got three rather stable veterans. This is really good. This is better than last time. He'll talk. He'll talk a lot. Like, he'll definitely take command. So now you have a guy who's taking more command. So now this helps JJ. This is great. This is a lot better pickup now to help JJ. So this is a good lesson learned, right? And JJ, I mean, he played a variety of picks. I think I mostly remembered him for his Braum. I think that was, like, one of the big picks I always remembered him for is his Braum. And for Viper, you know, again, having guy, having, like, a stable mid-jungle and a support who can actually play a little bit better, this was a big benefit to him. The thing is with this roster is that there was an issue with the systems in place. The th like, whatever the case was, the roster can work. This, literally, this roster can actually work and improve, but there was clear issues with just, you know, how to get Viper around some of his, like, mental, like, mental issues that he had in terms of just like handling pressure and whatever and like how you improve through playing into top side i don't remember how often they played in the top side so i really wish like in some ways that i went back and watched games but it's going to be a little bit too late at this point and for him yeah it's it kind of just sucks that it kind of just vanished out of like he just kind of vanished like, he, the pressure got too much to him, they never were able to recover him, and he was just gone. Because, you know, by the time he gets into this roster, you know, it, they added PoE, they added Ignar, so they, JJ is gone. And JJ suffered some of the same issues where, I believe, he, like, it just, like, the pressure kind of got to him a bit, and, like, he underperformed in the summer split. And then they decided to bump up and just get a far better player. At least a player who's deemed far better, right? And now he's just out of the system, just like how Fake God kind of disappeared out of the system. And that's where the issue with self-evaluation comes through, where why does he not get another opportunity in the end of the day? You know, that... 
that just seems that just feels a little weird in that day that he just couldn't not find another chance or people didn't figure out how to actually like work with him and so when one thing you're gonna see from the na ecosystem is that yeah like players will get like whatever the case is traumatized like feel the pressure too much on themselves uh maybe the org just doesn't give enough like positive feedback and like reinforcement that like we're gonna stick it with you like we're, we're really gonna get this through and so you can actually be the best player you can be which sounds kind of like a meme a little bit but that really is it and without that environment sticking through without the time yeah the guy just kind of disappears and goes back into academy or something like that and he has to prove himself down there and there were not a lot of players who were willing to push through that at that point there are definitely cases that i can go over but there was not a lot of players who wanted to push through it at that point and so like we had viper join this team and like now this is like a really big time team now we went from viper having like his buddy jj to talk to and like had like kind of like a more fresh face to kind of grow with and uh curve through now it's just him on his second year with yeah and like essentially what you want to say is an all-star team i don't want to say they're all-stars but like these are definitely some heavy names for the league and now he's kind of like just out here so now the pressure he was already facing last year is now amounting even more and yeah these guys just were not able to reel him in systems issue and just self-evaluation like what does viper really need like in the end of the day these guys all may be like pretty interesting pickups and everything but was this what he needed this i can't answer I can only create the question on whether was this what Viper really needed in the end of the day. Cody's son at this point, you know, he was going through various supports and various players, and I don't think they ever properly found a player like Olay, like Olay, that actually like made sense with Cody as a ball lane. And yeah, like he did fine on various rosters, but I think teams just didn't figure out what actually worked for Cody. Because Cody did have highlight plays as well. It's not like Cody was just the like worst AD in the league or anything like that. Like I he just I just think again, he just they just didn't find the right situations for him. You look at Johnson. You know, I said Johnson could have benefited more having Core JJ. Because I like I felt like Afro was just not as in it. In the end of the day, I, I don't think he actually was as much of a big brother leader as he possibly could be. And I think Johnson, I mean, if you've watched Johnson play, especially in solo queue in his streams, he was really good, man. Like, this guy was actually incredibly, incredibly good. Like, definitely like an A-level, like, talent. <laughs> I, most people would agree with this, too. Like, he, yeah, he didn't perform as well as you wish he did on stage and like in situations but i think man if he turned out he definitely would have been a known ad name in the lcs and part of this stems from both i think just it's just the wrong environment for johnson to excel on and i think more importantly i think it was just kind of the system i think actually i think it was three and five that probably hurt him the most in the end of the day because i think if he had play like coaching staff who knew how to properly test him and like essentially deal with him in a way because Johnson could be a bit of a joker and like kind of like derail things a little bit that would have been good and then with five the self-evaluation I think Johnson always had it in him like if you watch his solo queue right he was really fucking good so how do we get that like how do we get that you know and I just don't think whatever the case was teams did not evaluate properly enough on how to get him there and so that was just a missed talent that entered the lcs that could have been something really big meanwhile Stixay, who had a really great start and this is a probably one of the more notable things a good start typically helps tremendously for rookies like having that really good start to your initial years gives confidence in teams that you're going to be something and yeah it yeah it really it really makes a huge difference it really does and 
he was a lost situation. You know, we have players like Copy, you know, who were on C9, who are a really good talent, really good player. You had guys like Palafox, right? Like these guys almost had similar situations. You had Palafox and you had Copy. Copy never made it up because teams just did not want to risk playing him. Even though he was very capable, no one wanted to do the hard work of figuring out how do we fit him in. With Palafox, he was literally Palafaker. Like, he was actually, essentially, as you would say, the GOAT. The GOAT in Academy. Like, he was this damn good. And Poppy was a little bit similar. Poppy was really damn good in Academy. Granted, he, his team didn't in every time, like the way Pal Palafox's team did. But, yeah, he, he, it, the order for him to get a shot was on FlyQuest after finally a spot open and it was like, well, we'll pay less money to give him that. Like, there was literally less money and that's what led to him getting that chance. But the thing is, when he did get that chance, it almost screwed him because the team he landed on was just not a great setup again. So there's a rookie coming in who's a bit more confident and he was, he's a very intelligent player. I'll say that right now. Out of a lot of the players I've listened to and like talked to, this guy is very intelligent. Uh, he has really good takes. He can be a little lazy and a little confrontationist, like, in a way, but really great, you know? And I threw in Jose, who was just like a, you know, solo queue monster, right? So you have a solo queue monster with a guy who was, that you thought would be a leader, but again, it was like someday, you know, like, there, there was these cases where we had like someday, uh, Afro... And in this case, this is like Licorice, where you're taking a veteran player who you believe is a leader. You think, oh, this guy must be a leader, right? Terrible arrow, by the way. This guy must be a leader. But then he ends up just not being one. And so now you have to have like rookies or guys who are just kind of younger, just uh, pick up the slack. And it's just not going to work. Like Palafox is not a leader. But he can add on to the conversations do well. Having someone who actually does lead does a ton maybe you need it from your coach and this is where the systems comes in place right like maybe you have a coach who can like fill in this role a little bit but for the most part i'm gonna be honest this never happens like this never happens so the end result is you have johnson coming off a pretty <sighs> how was it how did this stigmatized team even do it did, it did terrible. So he's coming off a team that it was just like not not really remotely well like created for him to like perform at all. And he moves on to his second year. So he had a bad year as an as a, as a entrance rookie at, who's a very good rookie. So he has both some you know, he might have a chip, he could have a chip on his shoulder. Some rookies will not have a chip on their shoulder, which is obviously not great, but, you know, they'll be a little bit more like, oh God, I hope this doesn't happen again kind of situation. And he's paired up with Diamond and Dreams. So Diamond finally gets a shot for LCS, but they're just not really the right personalities. And neither of these supports can really match the way Johnson still wants to play in lane. Neither was like really Afro per se playing the way Johnson would like to play in lane. So he's gone two supports now, two years, two years with supports who just don't align with the way he like he kind of plays things in solo queue. And then you have a false leader with two fresh players coming in, and Diamond is technically fresh too. Like technically he's fresh as well. All in all, it's just it's just a design to just collapse and not be too useful. And this actually really hurts Palafox. And this actually semi hurts Jose. And it also hurts Johnson. Like, honestly, every single player, like, so many of these players got hurt from the way this roster was created and, like, designed and everything. And that's just, this just happens. Like, th this will just happen in LCS in the end of the day. Like you just take so you take some good players, you throw them on there, you think maybe this will work out, and it just it really does not work out. And so this will plague Johnson now. This will plague Palafox, who gets lucky enough to have that opportunity with CLG, 
This will plague Jose a bit, and so Jose does not grow as much his first year. And Jose was a soul cue monster as well. You had two, honestly, you had three really good, honestly, guys who should remain in LCS on this roster right here. But the way this was both designed for the team environment, the way this was designed for just, I don't even want to say roster strength, because I think roster strength, this isn't half bad. But the team environment, the systems in place, and just the self-evaluations on like what these players are and everything just fell apart. Because these guys did get time to play more. It's just... It was just... This part just kind of collapsed. So, we lose Johnson. Palafox gets lucky. Jose gets another year with FlyQuest, which is awesome. Um... And yeah, like I, I know I say I we lose Johnson and like he's playing for Flyquest again, but like already at this point with two underperformances by the roster, Johnson is like his mental fortitude has definitely dropped. And now that he gets Afro again, it's just like he never got the right support. And any bad habits he built, which does happen, bad habits, guys, will be built in your early years are now popping up, so you have to fight these off. And then Takui adds a whole other mix of, like, issues. And it's, again, you don't really have anyone who's willing to take full lead, because Afro's not... Afro's a fake leader. He's a fake leader, right? So this never helped, really, Jose that much. And then you picked up two players who are, again, you know, reasonable players. Like, Kumo can, like... Kumo was speaking up a lot in Academy. I remember that. Like, he was definitely actually taking a bit more of a leading role. But it's a, it's a little different when it comes to LCS because he obviously he struggles a bit more versus the player sets. Like, you look at guys like Someday, Summit. Uh, we still have Licorice, who did pretty well on Golden Guardians, Huni, Impact. Like, there's definitely some pretty tough competition for him to win out versus. So you can't have always the same effect. And Takui, yeah, like I said, he had his own set of problems. Really good player, but definitely not a leader or anything so jose just he had two years and the self-evaluation done after the first year was not correct on how to benefit him and yeah it just <laughs> we lose jose and then because you know flyquest never went to the top and then johnson didn't really get any bigger chances because at this point with three years under his belt and teams are looking at him and thinking do i really want to try this or like do I know how to actually properly, like, use him? They kind of said no. And he didn't really want to try to force anything and be on the bottom table of teams again. So the end result was from just simply, like, even just, like, FlyQuest, it's like you lose Jose, you lose Johnson. Kumo had his own set of things. Kumo was actually a pretty reasonable player. Seriously, he actually was. Um, I don't think he... Yeah, he played back here, way back here on Evil Geniuses, and it was a good roster, but like roster strength, it was definitely good. Zazel, great player to have him with. Sven is pretty good as well. Jisuke is a funny dude, but Bang just caused all kinds of issues in terms of the team environment. And Evil Geniuses didn't give him the time to properly play out because the next year they're they're grabbing impact. But then they have Deftly, who honestly was just a bust of a player at this point. Like I'm not trying to like be mean, but like he really was just kind of a bust of a player at this point. And so Kumo loses out on his opportunity to continue to grow when they could just pick up a better AD and then, you know, like a more, not, I don't say like someone's actually technical skills are better than Bang, but like the way Bang came through was not a one-to-one -one like improvement on how he was in Korea. Like at this point, he just really hated, like hated what was happening. And yeah, Impact is definitely better, but now you take a, a worse, you know, North American player to develop and such. I mean, this doesn't go anywhere. You know, Tactical replaced Double Lift, and he has a really strong core set of team on Team Liquid. But Alfari and Jensen are not really great players to kind of surround yourself around. Santorin and Core JJ are, which was great, but it was just it was just not the right. Honestly, like if they just not had one of these two players, if it was just one other different solo laner, not Alfaro, not Jensen, I think this would have turned out a lot better for Tactical. But it didn't. You know, you go all the way back to this 2016 TSM team, you know, 
this was just like mostly just like a combination of having players who actually just synergized super well together and they were good players and like that was the way tsm kind of approached it and when they added biofrost which was way more interesting in, in a way because again this is not the case of just importing a player for the sake of importing it continued to actually improve literally it literally continued to actually improve and it was really awesome to see and i just i just wish that was happening more often you know this i've I already listed uh, several examples on why like players like fail like i think keith and gate were just genuinely not that great of players like this will just happen like i don't think moon was really that great of a player and for those cases you know it is what it is like you're not always going to make it you're not always going to do well for the, for the guys who are specifically have chances to be so much more like matt alento was actually not a necessarily a bad player but he was stuck on probably literally one of the worst like pound for pound teams like team strength wise i'm sure the team environment was fine though contracts was kind of and as, as you would say a downer because i mean he was dropped like moved off c9 and now he's playing with a much weaker team so he was not like the best and the systems in place wasn't able to really properly recover it and then he also was playing with an ad who just wanted to chill not do anything so it was just not the right setup for matt to properly advance and since there was not enough positivity and like push both on coach probably on both on coaching staff and on his teammates the roster just was absolutely terrible and so matt was gone matt matt realized quickly that he just did not have it in him off off that first year and he was gone and this kind of just like i said this steadily does happen with various players like i talked about like with johnson with jj um though he is playing academy still but like yeah like for jj like it just didn't really turn out the way he wanted it to zazel kind of just left on his own terms i believe um biofrost you know he had he had a great roster to really like just play on in the beginning and because he had the confidence of that his, he can do well in the league that pushed him further even though i would say that he was a little bit he wasn't always necessarily the best i think just having the confidence on a roster to do well really just pushes you forward in the end of the day like that summer roster was with biofrost i believe right it wasn't with the yellow star it was with biofrost because he made that switch in and you know i don't know it's just i just wish that happened a lot more i really do because biofrost i think i want to say he was a well-regarded ladder player and so that was kind of like how they were doing things in 2013 2014 so the fact that he tsm was willing to go that route still even at this point was really good to see but they kind of stopped doing that as the years went on though they took some assimilated risks with like players like as we know with dardock um where dardock you know joining in like a big talent like and honestly he really was he really could have been a next level like dominating talent to be honest like his intro was when team liquid here i believe right 2016 and i talked about how this was just not the right team environment for him in the first place i don't think the right systems were in place for him and he was definitely given time to improve throughout the league but i think just no one really knew how to build the right roster around him so the self-evaluation no one knew what the right team environment is exactly for him and he definitely got some reasonable roster strength like i said that's not like that it was the issue but these other like points that came up just kind of failed him and sometimes some players are pretty difficult to solve like that is a thing it's not like i'm going to say like oh like you can solve every single player like that's always going to happen it's not true but I think Dardock's case was a rare case where, where like with Johnson, I think you actually could have solved it. With Dardock, maybe it was unsolvable, but he was definitely a big talent to lose out. And we, you know, we advanced all the way up to this point where we are now, like with CLG, where they decided to just pick up a bunch of players that were just kind of well regarded as their best in their role for a North American player, who just wouldn't be cost as costly as much as to say, let's just go with this chip on our shoulders, and it worked. 
And there are North American players with chips on their shoulder, like APA. But teams still don't want to risk it because they think, well, what if we get the bottom of the table where we do bad? No one basically wants to go through the process of having proper valuation, giving time, and then building the right system around it. No one wants to do these steps. It's, it, it just varies like just from time. like It varies quite often. And like I said, it's only because now that there's no money in this league that we're finally getting this to happen. And so that's why we have, like I said, this 100 Thieves roster, which I think was actually pretty awesome. We have FlyQuest, which had so happened to have a player who could handle it. And this actually turned out pretty well. Now they're making another change, adding Quad, who can definitely handle this kind of situation too. So the roster actually makes sense. You know, Dignitas, like XU doesn't necessarily make the most sense with these guys. And he they failed to give him time to actually properly develop, self-evaluate it. And he's gone. Now we're just back to Spico, who had two terrible years. You know, Immortals, Castle and Mask, pretty decent start. But it's something still not 100% clicking with the roster, but they're giving them time. And so they have time and ways to self-evaluate it and figure out if this is going to be better or not. You know, Shopify, Fake Odd had a pretty terrible first split. And they're making a change to add Tomio. So now Fake Odd will have more familiar faces with Fake Odd, Tomio, and Zazel still on the roster. And so now he has a, once again, it's a great team environment for him to play on with additional coaches to talk about the game with him and this will be the final test to see what happens but it's a really nice change in direction that shopify is going so yeah i'll admit that i'm not sure where lcs is going to go with, with with rookies in general and just how things have been because we're down to eight teams versus 10 teams so we can't even train and level up as many players as we could before but at least in 2024 there is a a better focus on actually making players work at least in terms for some teams like i think i think 100 thieves FlyQuest, shopify are at least giving ideas even with team liquid to a degree are actually showing signs of things that can work granted we do still have teams that just clearly don't like dignitas but i hope this trend continues Thanks for watching, guys. Sorry for once again making another 50 minute video covering LCS roster building, but I really did want to cover this and highlight good things that players had about them. Because, like I said, I don't want to just have a complete jumbled mess of what I was talking about before. See ya.